Recently, I've spent a lot of time reflecting on things. Whether it's regarding my personal life, my experiences, the world at large, or something entirely different. It feels like I've been even more introspective than usual. When it comes to all this, one of the main things I've been reflecting on so much is just simply the internet as a whole. With my age now, I'm genuinely part of a generation that was able to grow up alongside the internet. And though the internet has certainly evolved even in my time on this planet, that fact is still incredibly striking to me. This giant online space has been a part of me since basically the very beginning. Since I was a kid, I was already plugged into it, watching YouTube videos, searching up things I was curious about, and seeing things I wish I didn't see. But something that stands as even more striking than all of this is thinking about what I missed. A time where the internet wasn't so giant. A time where the concept of going online was not at all just something that was to be taken for granted. It was something special, a time where there was less control. Whenever we decide to cover an internet mystery, this feeling usually comes up, especially if it's regarding an old website like Death and Hell and See Me Rot. Even if you don't visit those websites yourself, I don't think it's hard at all for you to agree that when you just look at those sites, things just feel different. Even though those places are incredibly disturbing and strange, somehow still despite that, I'd find myself getting so envious of the time where the majority of the websites looked like that. Even though I've been exposed to the internet for as long as I can remember, that was not something that I could ever experience. But I wish I could've. But what if there was a way? Thankfully, today, there do exist many archival sites, one of which even being called The Old Net, and places like The Wayback Machine essentially giving you the ability to take any existing website and see what it looked like all those years ago. But there's one place that takes these possibilities even further. Today there exists a site called Wibby.org, which is a very special ability. It only indexes sites that do not use JavaScript, the programming language that a stunning 98% of all websites in the world use today. To add on to this, Wibby also has the ability to randomize and send you to a completely random website. Again, due to just how common JavaScript is, when it randomizes and sends you to a website, it will almost always be some place that is ancient by internet standards. Places from long before the internet was monetized or commercialized. Places that I'd always longed to see, but now in a way, I can. That's pretty much what this video is going to be about. As you can tell, it's very, very different than usual, but basically what I wanted to do here was live up to the title and just explore the old internet. Something even more exciting about this is due to the fact that not every old website was as bombastic as a Simi Rot or a Death in Hell. In taking this journey that we are about to foray in, maybe you will find that there are some true takeaways that we can make regarding the internet as a whole, and even some deeper things to ponder. Without further ado, let's simply get started. Tonight, we're just going to explore the old internet and see what things looked like, at least in as close of a way we can see these days. The very first site I landed on was titled Ray's Random Birdie Info. Seems simple enough, and well, it is. On this website, you can see a ton of miscellaneous info regarding birds, including things you'd want to know before owning one, especially the random stuff. But it also includes a ton of other information and stories about Ray's own birds. One of the highlights on the website is a section called Stupid Bird and Owner Tricks, which includes a ton of true stories from Ray's birds, including stories about how their bird, who was originally named Chaos, named himself Cheap. Really, this site is full of things like that, and as you can tell, it certainly lives up to the title. It's just one person's blog full of something he's very passionate about, and it even has a section about Ray specifically as well. All in all, it is simple, but very endearing. There is no big mystery or weird thing about this site that makes it feel off. It's genuinely just an ode to a wonderful type of companion. Info about the site states that it was established all the way back in 1994, and it appears to have been last touched in 2009, at least from what I can see. This site includes a multitude of links to other places, most of which sadly don't exist anymore, but it is really sweet to see this place still standing after all these years. For our second site, here is Internet Explorer is Evil. This is exactly the type of thing I hope to find too, because look at these animations. Anyways, as you can tell it very much lives up to the title, giving a plethora of reasons as to why this would be the case. 
The poster was calling it bloated, invasive, and it even began mentioning how this type of behavior is going to leave Microsoft to monopolize the entire internet. However, it doesn't end here. There is a humor section that makes a ton of tongue-in-cheek jokes about Internet Explorer, and then there is also a miscellaneous section full of rants. Craziest of all, it is still being updated to this day. From the time of recording, there was an update as recently as November, and all these years later, it truly doesn't look like much has changed. These rants are full of more cynicism regarding the internet, except of course for the modern day. There's complaints about the sluggish nature of Windows 11, and other things such as how this user can't support Google anymore. There's information about the creator of the website as well, with a section featuring even more strong opinions about stuff. That's about all there is to it, but to me it is interesting to see a live account from the time, of somebody seeing the internet beginning to change. The third site I found seemed to just be called Housefly, and as I arrived I was just greeted with the phrase, you'll catch death out here, hurry in. Accompanied with that is very simply just four images, each of which being clickable. Right off the bat I could tell that this was going to be some sort of art project, but I was very eager to play along and see what exactly it had in store. I decided to click image two first just because it was a door, and inside of it there was a poem. Also on the page was some foreboding art and a 3D animation that said, is anyone there? And it was clickable. Upon clicking that, we have another poem as well, as some more old school looking 3D art. When clicking this one, things get stranger. There's now an eerie face with two spinning chairs. After reading one more poem, you are then sent back to the start, as it appears that the room is complete. The rest of the rooms take a similar route, as they all have strange art and poems. One of the ones that really stood out to me was this one. It has an illustration of what appears to be a woman's face with text in the background repeating the phrase, no one likes me. But if you click the face, it begins crying and everything becomes more and more intense. After that page is over, there's a full on animation of a crying face with a cat in the foreground. This art project definitely appears to be more personal, as some of the poems are very specific. And that picture of the cat makes me wonder if that is the pet the creator of the site lost in the past. One more thing I must mention is that this site actually is not nearly as old as everything else featured here, as this site was actually made with the NeoCities engine, which is something I wanted to briefly mention. NeoCities is a web creation engine created in 2013 with the goal of reviving the old, unmonetized era of the internet. It was inspired by GeoCities, which was a hugely popular web hosting service founded in 1994 and eventually purchased by Yahoo in 1999, where it quickly began disintegrating until it was finally ended in 2009. In talking about the old internet, there was no way that could be done without mentioning GeoCities. It was completely free to use and unmonetized, and served as one of the most powerful symbols of this era. If we ever do another deep dive into the old internet, we will try and figure out if there's a way to surf old GeoCity sites. Next up I found something much more simple, a shrine to the NES game Kid Icarus, as the site itself says. Kid Icarus is one of my favorite NES games. I played it a lot and beat it quite a few times. It is often called the companion game to Metroid, and the two games do share a similar graphic and music style. Unlike Metroid, Kid Icarus' setting is not outer space, but a mythical world based somewhat in part on Greek mythology, although many of the monsters are unlike anything you've ever seen before. It has that same sort of dark and gloomy atmosphere of Metroid, which sort of gives it a gothic feeling. Kid Icarus is also one of the most difficult games for the NES. This shrine is meant to showcase one of my favorite and most unusual games. And that's exactly what the site does. There's a section all about the characters, the enemies, music, and there are even sections about fan art. Once again, similar to the first site, it's heartwarming to see a place created by one person just showcasing a singular passion. And speaking of singular passions, let's check out Jeff's Robots, a place where Jeff is clearly very passionate about robots as he seeks to collect them. You can tell this one is old too, because not only does it have a copyright from 1997, it also says that this site is best at an 800 by 600 resolution. It also features more very, very charming 3D animations, one of my favorite staples that some of these old websites used to have. The collection of robots truly does seem to be vast too.
A site that I found incredibly fascinating upon taking this journey was one called Amcho.com, and the reason why is because it is a very old place, talking about the concept of the internet. As the headline says, what can the internet do for me? And as you can see, this website lays out some of the important things the World Wide Web can do for you, starting with email. This is probably the least hyped part of the electronic revolution. It is also the easiest to understand, and is also probably the most useful. Think of email as a clever fax machine. With a fax, you can send and receive pages of information. You can do the same with email, but without having to print the pages first. For example, instead of printing out your order to a supplier and then faxing it, all you need to do is click a few buttons on the screen and the message can be emailed, not to a public fax machine, but directly to the person who will deal with your order. When you receive an email, rather than having to rekey all the information, it is already on your computer. All you need to do is copy and paste it into any other application, such as a report in a word processor. Email messages can be forwarded to whoever needs to deal with the message next. It then talks more about the internet and websites as a whole. If it wasn't worth it, all the large companies would not be there. The larger companies are there because they can see a possible source of profit and are afraid of missing out on the bonanza. There are many stories of websites that are making a fortune. These I think should be taken with a pinch of salt. The sites that are probably making money are those selling pictures on a pay-by-view basis. Maybe the quality is better if you pay for it. Possibly the search engines are making money through advertising. But probably the greatest benefit is to existing businesses that use the internet as a tool to improve their existing business. Read the story by Michael Schreiner of how Microvision computer products use the internet to make the business grow and become more profitable. The main reason for most companies being on the internet is to provide information about themselves and their products to the general public and their customers and suppliers. Treat your website like an entry in the yellow pages, but with the added advantage of being able to answer many of your potential customers and suppliers questions before they need to phone you. Some companies are using the internet to save costs. If you think about it, if you are answering the telephone and most of the questions are similar, then putting the info on the web must be a lot cheaper, on the condition that your target audience has access to the web. Examples that come to mind are train timetables, freight transport. At the bottom of the site, we can see when this article was written. August 1997, reviewed in 1998, and in 1999. And to me, it was just a really captivating read. Just seeing the internet being described in this way puts so much into perspective. Thinking about it in terms of evolution and seeing firsthand how it was thought of when it was fresh. Next up, we have a site all about Furbies. Except it's not about buying them or talking about how cute they are. No, this site is about Furby autopsies. It mentions how they had a particular Furby for about three days. Two of those days it was spent sleeping, and then after that, his batteries ran out. After the batteries were replaced, the Furby supposedly began acting really weird. His eyes were stuck half open, it was making a weird buzzing noise, and resetting it would not help at all. At some point, it even began smelling, so this left only one option. Dozens of experiments with trying to unjam and reset and reboot him were unable to restore him to healthy operation. Tulika was definitely a terminally ill Furby. So we did what any bereaved Furby owner would do, we cut him up and took pictures. So in case you ever wondered, here is a step-by-step -step guide of how to give a Furby an autopsy. This autopsy took place in 1998, meaning that this is likely around when the website was created too. And it's just so weirdly macabre, even though we're talking about a toy. There's a section about the Furby's guts, its cause of death, and much, much more. There's even a frequently asked questions section full of questions like, does Furby learn? Do you hate Furbies? Does Furby hear, see? And last but not least, can a Furby catch fire? For our final website for the time being, we're going to talk about one that, in all honesty, is pretty tragic. A site all about a son creating a tribute and trying to help his dad. This is SaveWalterWhite.com. Walter White apparently is a high school chemistry teacher and someone being described as annoyingly smart, and I feel like we all know somebody like that. His son also was in high school and decided to try and see if he could raise funds for a surgery, a truly noble and sweet act. As we can see from this paragraph, we can tell just how deeply they all care about each other. Walter White in here seems like a true family man, someone who would never ever hide anything from them. A man of total honesty. Weirdly, when you try to donate, it actually takes you to AMC's website. I mean, how random and weird is that? Do they think Walter White is an actor or something? Well, there you have it. We've just explored the old internet. 
at least to the best ability that we can for now, and the results really were telling. As we saw, the majority of the websites were technically pretty mundane. We saw a site about birds, an art project, a video game series, robotics, an essay, and Walter White. And throughout all this, it put into even greater perspective just how much things have changed, confirming many of the things I said at the start. We saw a time where the internet was seen as exciting. It was seen as a place for creativity, for hobbyists to share their passions with the world, and of course, for people in all reaches of the planet to communicate with one another. It was a place that, to me, seemed in a strange way to almost mirror, though very rapidly, humanity's evolution. Many lifetimes ago, living was all about hunting for food and survival. The world was huge, mostly untouched, full of mystery and unknowns, and there weren't any rules yet. But as time passed, things evolved. Rules were created and enforced, monopolies were born. I think in a way a huge part of the allure to the internet was to escape what the world had become. The internet was a symbol of freedom when it was born, but that simply is not the reality that we live in anymore. Much like how the world changed over time, so did the internet, except much, much more rapidly. Nowadays the reality of the internet is becoming much closer to real life. A small selection of companies are now in control of the majority of all content readily available for us to see. And because of this, though the internet is much larger today than it was 20 years ago, it certainly feels smaller, doesn't it? All of what is being said here feels remarkably bleak, and in some ways it is. There is definitely an element of fear I could completely understand being felt when thinking about the internet's evolution in this way. However, there may be a light, even if it is a small one, at the end of the tunnel. If there is one other thing we saw throughout this journey through internet time, it was that a shockingly high number of these websites were still being updated. That raises the question, how many of these classic old internet websites are still out there, still being given the same type of love that people gave websites decades ago? I have a feeling there may be more of them out there than you think, and though they are frustratingly and sadly difficult to find, it is relieving that this bygone era does still live on in a way. As this video comes to a close, I want to end it on a question. For those of you that did get to experience this old internet, what are some of the fondest memories you have from this time? If we could turn a subject such as this into a discussion or recollection, I think that would be very fitting. Thank you guys so much for watching. This video was a lot different than normal, and we'd absolutely be down to make another one if you enjoyed it. If you like this video, of course, make sure to like this video and subscribe. If you like the channel, make sure to check out our social medias in the description below. Make sure to stop by our Discord, it really is the best place to chat with us and hang with fellow debunk enthusiasts. Of course, if you'd like to support the channel a little bit more, head on over to our Patreon, Debunk Plus. Only a dollar a month and you guys get access to videos early, script PDFs, whatever random stuff we decide to put up, and more. As always, my name is Seth from Debunk File. See you guys next time. Bye.